This episode is sponsored by Brilliant.org. SpaceX Starship updates, Starlink v1-1 aftermath and Starship reusability. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It? So let's dive right into the exciting news topics. My name is Felix and I've been your host for the past 50 episodes. And what you just saw was not even six months ago. Episode by episode, the channel has been building quality and audience. An idea turned into reality, turned into a dream come true. And you know what I like the most about What About It? Every single day. I know, I always say these thanks in the end, but this time I wanted to do it in the beginning so everybody of you can hear it. So thank you very much for all your support, for the likes, for the comments, for the subscriptions, and last but not least, to all my patrons. Thank you for watching our future unfold together with me. So here's to another 50 episodes full of the latest and greatest about space and science. And as always, there has been a lot going on in the space industry lately, so let's dive right in. Starship Updates Boca Chica is thriving right now, more so than ever before. The whole launch facility is in an uproar in preparation for the next big milestone, the Starship Mark I prototype inaugural flight. At the shipyard, the cone section of Starship Mark I is in the last preparations ahead of its transfer to the launch site. The canard fins are fully mounted now and the aerodynamic fairings are installed on both sides. I don't know exactly yet how the fins will move with these large fairings, but no matter what will happen, the day we find out is closing in fast. Do you see these holes in the fairings? Either they are for airflow, for pressure sensors, or something is still missing and might be installed later. What do you think? Tell me in the comments. At the shipyard, more and more oxygen is being delivered to the fuel farms. No doubt in preparations for pressure testing and maybe even already for the launch. The street towards the launch site has been as busy as never before. Very recently we've also seen the lower fins being transported to the launch site. Boca Chica Gal again provided us with incredible pictures. Here you can see how much better and more precise the fins have been manufactured. This is precision work, very much unlike what we can see on the fuselage. For all those who are still puzzled about the rough look of SpaceX's Starship Mark I, this should give a good indicator that SpaceX, of course, is able to produce precisely manufactured parts. So the only possible reason for them not building all the parts of Starship like this is that it's simply not needed yet. Not for Mark I and not for what it's supposed to do. A simple 20km test flight and first tests of the fin controlled descent. And SpaceX didn't wait long to put the fins on the tank section. They've both been mounted and we're getting closer to what Starship looked like on the outside before the presentation. Again, everything worked as intended. The fins were a perfect fit. Another indicator for the precision work on the parts that matter for Mark I. Here you can see another nice view of one of the lower fin actuators. You can tell by the thickness of the steel used that these will need to withstand a lot of force on descent. And again, the parts that matter are built with precision. Try to spot a bad welding or an uneven fit here. You won't find nearly as much as on other parts of the prototype even though it's still version 1 of the technology. The main raceways on the sides of the tank section are being covered up again as well. First of all, this is an indicator for the work on the fuel lines and cable looms being done. Secondly, if you look closer, you can see reinforcements attached to the edges and maybe even more important, you can see round connections of some sort. Either these are for access to the pipes and cables under it or they again are sensors for pressure for example. Both could be possible and none can really be ruled out. Again, what do you think? Starship Mark 1 is nearing completion. If SpaceX really wants to make it fly before the end of the year though, they will need to hurry. Roughly six weeks are left and there are a few things left to do. The two halves have not been stacked. The legs still need work. The engines are missing. Let alone system tests, wet rehearsals, FAA filings and probably a thousand other things we don't even know about. I myself am optimistic though that it could work out. On the other hand though, I wouldn't mind if it takes a month or two longer than initially expected to get things right. An RUD will give us data. A perfectly executed test flight would prove though that SpaceX is on the right track. As always, if you liked what you just saw, take the time to hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't yet to get notifications of my episodes every Monday and Thursday. Starlink V1-1 Aftermath 
Wow, what a week. Not only did SpaceX make a lot of progress in Boca Chica again, but we also got a rocket launch. A desperately needed fix of rocket glory. A few new records broken and a milestone on the way of funding the Starship project. On Monday, SpaceX launched Booster B1048 with an upper stage and a very important payload on top. The first 60 production level Starlink satellites. I of course did a live stream and I want to thank all those who attended and those who helped organize it, my moderators. Awesome job, thanks again. SpaceX performed a perfectly executed launch, landing and deployment. Falcon 9 works like a charm. After a few years of landed boosters, routine kicks in. The sensation of landing boosters is only still there for us hardcore enthusiasts as we know how much work and brain is involved in making it happen. The general public though doesn't even notice it anymore. Starlink is revolutionary. Starlink will bring low latency broadband internet to almost every square meter of our planet. Something simply not achievable with ground-based technology. Starlink will fund Starship and in return maybe even get us to Mars in the not too distant future. And the hardware shot into orbit on Monday's launch was quite different from what we saw on the last Starlink launch. Parabolic antennas have been added to every satellite, presumably for connections to the ground. Internet service will be transmitted through a flat antenna, probably covering most of one side of the Starlink satellites. This smaller dish though is for a connection to a single location on the ground. So my guess is that it must be for telemetry, tracking and command or TTC needed to observe and control the constellation. The satellite's albedo has been reduced as well. This is a video of the just deployed new batch of Starlink satellites after launch prior to orbit raising. According to SpaceX, they are closely working with the astronomy community to reduce effects as much as possible to prevent any interference with scientific observations of the night sky. This will definitely be needed if SpaceX turns their plans into reality. 42,000 satellites will definitely make LEO much more crowded than it is right now. SpaceX tweeted that one of the sats won't make it into orbit and will most likely be burning up in the upper atmosphere. To make sure that Starlink satellites burn up completely and as quickly as possible, the V1 satellites have been further improved to make every part of them 100% demisable. SpaceX stated in their official press kit for this launch that Starlink will start providing service to parts of Canada and the US after just 6 launches and that the rest of the world will get service after just 24 launches. So the US should get the first service after just 6 months and the rest of the world within roughly 1 year. Starship reusability When it comes to SpaceX's Starship, one aspect is the most important one – rapid reusability. Elon Musk and his team try to create a super heavy launch vehicle that acts like a normal airplane. Fly, land, refuel and fly again. Most of those watching this episode will know about this already, but don't skip to the bloopers just yet. Elon Musk recently elaborated on a lot of the numbers surrounding this aspect. It all started at the recent talk he held at the US Air Force Space Pitch Day on November 5th. Now these are aspirational numbers and they will, if ever, only be achieved with well-developed hardware and not with any of the prototypes coming before that. But nonetheless, let's look at some of the things he recently clarified. First of all, he finally gave us numbers on what a Starship will cost to operate. He said that each launch will burn around $900,000 worth of propellant and in total one launch will cost around $2 million. For those who don't know how much this is, it is insanely cheap. In fact, it's cheaper than the smallest rockets that can reach space. A Falcon 9, considered to be the cheapest ride to space right now when it comes to full-size orbital rockets, costs around $50 million per launch and is capable of lifting roughly 15 metric tons to LEO when partially reused. That's roughly $3,333 per kilogram if you manage to absolutely maximize your payload, which almost never happens. Starship, on the other hand, will be able to lift 100 tons, later maybe even 150 tons of payload to LEO for $2 million. Now hold on to your seatbelts. That's $20 per kilogram, not even calculating with the 150 ton payload version. $20. A Starlink satellite, for example, weighs 227 kilograms and so the price for sending it to LEO is $756,591.
Sending the same satellite up to LEO on board a Starship will cost SpaceX $4,540. That's not just a simple price change. That's a new era of space travel. Calculate for yourself what it would cost to do a trip to space for you. Just multiply your own body weight by 20. Cheap enough? He elaborated further on Twitter stating yet again that a Starship will be capable of launching thrice a day. That's three times 100 tons per day per Starship. When it comes to heavy objects in orbit, I always like to take the ISS as an example. It weighs 420 tons. A single Starship would launch the weight of the ISS into LEO in a bit more than a day. If you use the 150 tons aspirational goal, you'd be done in three launches. One day. The current global payload capacity per year is roughly 500 tons. Two days with a single Starship. These numbers are probably the best way to explain that Starship won't be just a bigger rocket. Imagine if SpaceX would build as many Starships as they build Falcon boosters. Roughly 100 so far. This would raise the planet's total payload capacity to roughly 10 million tons per year to LEO. He also said that SpaceX would need around a thousand Starships to build a self-sustaining Mars colony or Mars Base 1 as he calls it and that roughly 1 million tons of payload to Mars would be needed in the process. Elon also said again that SpaceX is planning to build roughly one Raptor engine per day by next year. That's 365 Raptors per year. Most of them being built without a throttle or gimbal for Super Heavy Starship's booster. The throttle is being left out to maximize thrust to around 300 tons per engine. That's more than 100,000 tons of thrust per year added to the capability of the Starship fleet. Just a few years ago, these numbers would have sounded like complete sci-fi. They are so far apart from what we can do right now that it's hard to imagine that we can actually achieve them. I can understand all those who say that SpaceX will never succeed with this plan. It just seems out of reach. The reason for it seeming out of reach is just not that it can't be done. It just simply can't be done with a traditional rocket like the Space Launch System or even Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. If this makes you think about how someone can come up with such a plan, you might want to dust off your knowledge about scientific thinking. Everything Elon Musk says is based on hard facts. And an excellent place to do so is Brilliant.org. Nature is a puzzle that can be pieced together with some simple rules. What seems complex at first can be explained in an easy way if you do it like Brilliant.org. How do statics work and what makes a structure stable? Why do we use gears? What is balance? How does heat flow and how do fluids behave in a tank system? All these are the basic rules to achieve SpaceX's numbers. To become a future Starship specialist and at the same time support What About It, go to brilliant.org slash whataboutit and sign up for free to get access to their weekly brain teasers and puzzles. And if you choose to get the premium subscription, the first 200 to sign up through the link will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. So don't rely on speculation. Find out for yourself if SpaceX's numbers can work with brilliant.org. Link is in the description. So this wraps up today's episode of What About It? What are the holes in the Canarchins for and are $20 per kilogram cheap enough for your first trip to space? As always, tell me in the comments. And here we are again at the end of the episode, thanking those who provide the most vital support to What About It? The patrons. And today is one of those days where I have so many arrivals that I have to read their names of a list. And let me tell you something, it's an honor. So everyone, please give a warm welcome to Joe Stevens, Jeffrey Mason, Fridolin Emil Hagens, Rambo Smith, Nobody Expected the Spanish Inquisition, Klaus Kingstorff, Greg H2O, Helena Boyer, and NSR We Go. You rock. Thank you for watching this episode of What About It? If you liked what you saw, please don't forget to hit the like and the subscribe button because that helps the most. Feel free to hit me up on my Patreon page so I can get additional help in doing more and better content. As this gives me the time to focus on what I love doing the most, to give you the latest and greatest about space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time. Wow, what a week. What a week. And I don't know what to say, but I'm trying to do it anyway. Yes, let's dive in. Boca Chica is thriving right now. Mortho. Mortho. Hmm. No. <laughs> oh.